All right, uh, thanks all for coming. I'll try to get you out by break time so we don't have coffee in the space. Um, we'll, uh, we'll have time for questions during, uh, during the presentation, so if you have any, just raise your hand. I'll try to take them when I can. Since we have a break after, uh, you can find me them as well. I'll publish the slides later and I'll announce them on, on Twitter. So. Um, there will be a bunch of little links down here at the left and at the right. They tend to be like further reading links to the thing I'm talking about, the code or whatever. So you don't have to write down two periods of those things after. All right. So a little bit about how I got here. I used to run the right database. Um, anybody here get IP space? Yes? No? OK, then you've dealt with us before. We're the ones who don't like to give them out very much. Um, <laughs> we're, the, we're the authority store for uh, Europe, Middle East, and Russia, so the green part there. And it was really cool to see you know, how the internet works and, and fiddling with that type of stuff. And after that, I went to Canonical. Anybody here use Ubuntu? Nice. Excellent. Um, yeah, we're, we're quite happy about that one. I, did, I was the engineering manager for 10.04 and 10.10, which is the first two big releases we did for EC2. Um, I quite like them. Um, there's a few <coughs> little things in there that I didn't quite manage to fix. We have about a two, three hundred lines of public code. Again work around the bits that we missed. Um, but I would argue it's still the best operating system for EC2. Uh, it's definitely the most popular one. Uh, and if you run Java on Ubuntu, I'm not. <coughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we run it as well, so I kind of know what you're doing. And so four years ago, I joined a company called Crux, uh, their VP of operations. Uh, it's kind of uh, Google Analytics for audiences uh, rather than traffic. And we have a very, very strong focus on, on data privacy. So the way I explain it to my mom is that thing that Netflix does to figure out what you want to watch and that thing that Amazon does to figure out what you want to buy, we do that for everybody else. So for any type of content you want to consume, you kind of use us for that. And here's a list of the types of people who do that. You'll notice a lot of big publishers, a lot of content customization, article recommendation, stuff like that. It tends to flow through us, um, and then you, you get hopefully more of what you want. Uh, especially the data privacy bit was a huge deal here in Europe because the, the laws are much more stringent than in the US. Um, so that, that gave us a very interesting segue. Uh, but these are uh, these are fairly big web pages, and as a result of being their infrastructure provider, for every request that they get, we get at least one, which is a new data point. But in general, it'll also be like, well, what is this user like? Frequency capping and that stuff. So um, we get lots of traffic from them, um, and we, we're on the critical path for their delivery. Right? You're supposed to paint the content based on what we do, and so that also makes outages really, really bad. It's a very interesting environment to be in. Um, so I'll start by saying this is a bit of an apples and oranges uh, comparison. Um, but it's kind of like Twitter's traffic, Wikipedia's traffic, and ours. And Twitter does more with their tweets as they come in than we do with our incoming data. But still, they give you an idea. Um, they do about 9,000 tweets on average. I think their previous record was 25,000 in a second. It was then broken with 33,000 at Japanese New Year last year. I remember we were texting Happy New Year to each other. And that's about our daily average. So we do about 33,000 new data points every second throughout the day. Peaks are double that. And on the entire infrastructure, it's about 75,000 requests a second on average. So it's, it's a lot of stuff. And it's because we reach quite a few people. So our reach is about double that of, of Wikipedia's. And we end up with a, with a user data store of about a million, uh, sorry, billion, billion and a half keys. And we process about 25 terabytes of data every day. It's a lot. Um, and when you process that much data, um, for this many users, for this many clients, any small decision that you make, any small change you make, can have a really, really big impact. And if it's a, a change in the service performance, then we want to know, of course. And if we're trying to make a design decision, we, we want to make a, a very well-informed one. And if it's a cost-benefit analysis, of course, we want to look at everything possible. And so to do that, we, we collect about a million unique metrics every second. Uh, this just flows straight in from our, our production servers. And what I want to talk about today is how we do that. And how we do that in such a way that it's useful to you and how you can make them actionable. Because having metrics is one thing, but if you can act on sitting on a big pile of data. We'll talk a little bit about how to visualize it as well. Um, the most effective visualizations are often, though, depending on the company you're in or your specific use case. Uh, for the tools I'll be showing you, there are dozens of visualization methods, so if the one that I'm having to be highlighting doesn't work for you, don't worry about it, there's many more. Go explore. Uh, and the same for monitoring. I'll touch on it a little bit, but my bet is that you already have a monitoring system in place. Actually, you know what? Who works at a place with their product that doesn't have monitoring in place? Cameras pointed at me, nobody will see you raise your hand. <laughs> 
So when you raise the finger, like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll avoid eye contact. Sorry, avoid on tap eye contact for the rest of the conversation. Uh, but th there are probably going to be many more constraints on your monitoring system, just whether it can collect tons of metrics or not. Uh, but again, I'll touch on some that at least can, and you can drive into that. It's really just about the, the metrics themselves. But that said, don't underestimate the visualization. It's a really, really big deal. Um, so computers can do a lot for you, but the human brain is fantastic at recognizing patterns and shapes. It's what we do better than computers do. Uh, and you don't want to just be looking at data points when something's wrong. If you have a really good visualization, a really good way to deal with your metrics, um, it'll answer questions like, well, does it always behave like this? What is normal? And how is it different from right now? What changed recently versus some time ago? Is it a code deploy? Did some machines fail? Is there a network issue? What correlates strongly? Is this guy a symptom or the cause of the problem? And inversely, like, what are the leading indicators? Is this guy over? When this guy starts spiking, does that mean 15 minutes down the line you're going to have a big problem? Good visualizations will help you with that. And sometimes it's as easy as a shape. So when we started growing, and I was there when the very first server came up and it hit the very first data point. Uh, it was Facebook's Brony page, by the way. So I learned what Bronies were. I was like, oh, this is cool. It's Bronies. And then I learned. Um, if you don't know what Bronies are, don't Google it. And you'll be better off. It's very, very disturbing. It involves grown men and my little ponies. Anyway, the, the point is, I was there when the first one came in. And, and as, as the data grew, we started seeing certain shapes. A very obvious shape is um, that the drop off in Europe is much steeper for traffic than it is in the US. US spans three time zones. Europe, at least the part that we see most of, is on the UK time zone and Central European time. So, whereas in the US, the traffic would go down like this, in Europe, it's a little bit sharper like that. It's shapes. You know nothing's wrong, it's just the shape of things. And at some point, we saw an interesting shape. It was a, it was a pretty uh, steep increase over about 30 minutes of time. It was about a 25 to 30% increase, and then a fairly sharp decline. In the middle of the day, there was no random, uh, there was no particular time this was happening. And we learned this is the shape of a news event. That's how long it takes when something big happens in the world. Um, when somebody bombs Boston, when the royal baby is born, they all have the same shape. It takes 30 minutes like this, and it's 25% increase. It goes like that, and it drops off. So just by looking at the shape, I know I should go check the New York Times because there's something interesting about that. <laughs> uh, so I was telling this story to, to one of my friends who works at Google and says, oh, we've got a shape like that too. And he describes to me the scenario. He says, well, he works in the SRE team for search. Well, at some point, we started getting this, this shape and it was basically a 20 to 25% traffic increase, but no cache misses, almost no cache misses. So the internet was searching massively for a thing. And the thing is, it's Facebook down. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Facebook down, you go to Google, you see if it's down or not. And so he can see at the length of his curve how long Facebook is down. Like, does it take like two minutes? It's <laughs> gotten better over time. And someone asks, it's like, using a minute or two, and they're like, oh, look, Facebook's down. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> so anyway, shapes, shapes matter. Shapes are important. And visualization can help you with that. Um, but, but just important is that it's the insight that you get from it that really matters. Um, we think it's a core competence. We collect these metrics because the data gives us the core competence. Most people use it to diagnose outages or diagnose problems. It's a great tool for that. You should. Um, but it helps you understand trends over time. Capacity planning. Performance tuning. You can run AV tests against it. Cost predictions and optimization. It's a big deal. Uh, learning what the new normal is for your application stack when you upgraded Django to something else or tried out this new load balancing solution. Um, design decisions. Very big deal. I mean, you can guess or you can use the data to prove you're right or wrong. And not at the very least, your KPI and business metric should be in here somewhere. And they're not just for operators. Is anybody here not sysadmin or sysadmin affiliated or enthusiastic? <laughs> Again, one, two, two, this is okay. Like, it's cool that you're here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> you can raise that one time. I won't even say anything. But anyway, so they help your developers write better code. It's a good thing about metrics. Like, you, you can understand it. Uh, your team will make much better purchasing decisions if they know what they're trying to buy for. Um, good product decisions, rather than off the whim of your product manager, you have data to back it up. Um, salespeople, they can prove that things actually work. We send our latency graphs to our customers all the time. It's like, look, it's like in microseconds. Is, is your site faster than that? Oh, oh, good. Yeah, fine. Um, and for your support team to actually quantify a problem, right? Like, it's slow. It takes a while. Users are seeing errors. Well, how much? How often? Where? How many? It's all there. And they can even help you get good investment. So I was told that to take the numbers off the graph, apparently it's company proprietary stuff, but this is our bottom line 
this is how our revenue has been growing over some period of time, and the red bits is how our cost has been tracking. We've grown about 10x without really going up to cost. And that's because using all the data that we have, we figured out where to optimize, where the waste was, where we weren't getting the biggest bang for our buck. And this is all of our stuff. This is uh, compute, hosting, storage, CDN, DNS, you name it. Everywhere where we could shave something off, do something smarter, do something better, we did. And it, and it was a pretty good result. And to give you an idea, our revenue tracks with the amount of work we do for our customers. So the more paid views we see, the more money we get. The more unique users we see, the more money we get. So as our load goes up 10 times, our revenue goes up 10 times. And we know that using the data we have, we have earned at least one round of funding. Which if you're anything of a Silicon Valley startup person, you know what a big deal that is. Like, that's cash in our pocket. Right? So what does that look like? What's, what's like the secret sauce that makes this happen? Um, we made it easy to use. That's it. That's really all there's to it. Like, you want lots of metrics? Make it easy to do so. There's a, you know, a few other things that you'd like to have. Like, you know, highly scalable, highly cost effective. It's a, it's a really big deal. It should be easy to operate. You don't want your sysadmins chasing down the metric system all the time when you should be building other stuff. Uh, it should be easy to integrate with. Uh, it's easy to interrogate, get the data out again. Highly configurable, because everybody has their own business and doing things in their own specific way. And it should be flexible and interesting. It's going to come from many different places. Not everything is going to conform to your standard of your, of your metric gathering. So make sure that you can get it in quite easily. And I'll do my best to cover all of these things. Um, but I can't stress it enough. Make it easy to use. You can't look at metrics you don't have. If it's hard to be added, you're not going to get them. Anyway, let's start by what we think we want to see. <laughs> from all of the stuff you're going to be collecting, um, you probably only need a subset to make a specific decision uh, or when you're trying to answer a specific question. And so what, what is it that you should be showing on your internal dashboard? What is it that really makes sense? Um, it's going to be different from company to company, uh, but in our case, and I found many people I talk to, despite the millions of metrics you're collecting, it's actually pretty straightforward. If you're running a service, it's two things, latency and error rates. It's really all those things. Because in the end, you care about a good user experience. And it means that when people come in, they get what they want, and they get it rather quickly. So let me walk you through kind of how we think about building these dashboards and what data comes in, and then we'll flow from there. So obviously, you start with the request rates. We run tons of different services. I just picked one that we happen to be running. And all of them have basically the same characteristics. Some request comes in, it takes a certain amount of time to do it. So here's the request and error rate. Uh, it's aggregated across all of our clusters. Good for us. The error rate is pretty low, currently 0.1 per second. It's not bad against 4,300 good ones. Um, this is a two-day window. You see the, the shape of the pattern. It's pretty consistent. There's a little bump. Um, that's usually when some sort of time zone wakes up. We go to the loo and <coughs> the news. Um, next part is the response time of the cluster, uh, the cluster. We only track two response times, 95th and 99th. If you track average response time, you're telling me you don't give a crap about half of your users. So you know, track the upper ones. Uh, we track the worst case, 95th percent. This is probably a cluster with, let's say, 25, 30 machines in it. So if you have two outliers and you would take the average 95th, it would be masked. So we only graph the worst 95th and 99th. And the reason that we track both of them is it tells you a lot. If the 99th is, is much more spiky than the 95th, it's a very different shape than when 95th and 99th track. If they track, you probably have a more systemic problem. If the 99th is very spiky, the 95th is pretty flat, you probably have outliers and queries. Again, shapes tell you everything. I don't even know if you know the numbers to know what the problem is. Um, you can also see that there's a little spike every now and then at the 99th percentile. I don't know why yet, but at least I know it's happening. So if I care enough, we can go and investigate. Um, one of the reasons that that spike might be there is because <coughs> you, um, you change something. You don't want to be the system who says no, like you can't deploy things, you can't have changes. Uh, so you want to encourage that. And two of the things that we do all the time is deployments of code, like the brown line of deployments. So that happened three times in the last two days for this specific service. Two very close to each other. So I'm pretty sure the devs will tell me it was a quick feature release. <laughs> <laughs> or a robot. Uh, but also MapReduce. We run lots of batch jobs, and batch jobs write into data stores. And data stores being written to probably means cache evictions or maybe uh, uh, longer eight times on disks, and if you're dependent on those things, your latency might go up. So the first thing I want to know is like, well, is any of these two very common things going on? Because if they are, that tells me a lot about why a graph might have a certain shape. And so we just grab the events, we, we emit those from the particular jobs that happen, we go over to fly to show very easy. 
The next one is the horizontal line. What's okay? And when you're developing a service, or when your devs are developing a service, uh, I seem to encourage them to run benchmarks so they have a fair idea of, of what the ideal capacity would be. And not to set the expected capacity, which is the horizontal line here, to about two thirds of the optimal capacity. And we do that for two reasons. One, if the code changes and it becomes a bit slower, we're still good. We don't see cascading failures. And the second one, if the nodes start falling away, we still have some extra capacity. So that's all. Um, this helps us visualize what our capacity is. And just that horizontal line tells you whether you're trending towards it, whether you should do something or not. This is aside again from monitoring, it's just for shapes and for performance. And then we put all that stuff in a single graph. We have one of these graphs for every service that we run, and we run several dozen of them. They're in a bunch of TVs in our development area. We're also in developments next to each other, and we're just on there. Every day when we do our daily stand-up, we do that next to those TVs. So at least once a day, everybody stands next to these things and learns what the normal is. Um, we have more granular dashboards for some of our services that help us troubleshoot very common things. You know, we have a Cassandra cluster when heap space is a problem, when long outstanding compactions are a problem. Those are good indicators, so we have like, more granular stuff for that. But for every service we have, we have at least this dashboard. Short, sweet, and simple, tells you everything you know. Is it healthy or not? What's going on? From there on, you can do. So this is a great place to start. So to round out the diagnostic part of two dashboards, I wanted to highlight two more things that went in this particular graph. Um, most deviant nodes, I like the word deviant, I don't know why. <laughs> the, the functions actually called most deviant, so it's like, oh, I should use that. Um, this tracks nodes against the average, and the, uh, the brown line, which is actually the bottom line here, is the average. So most deviant could also be significantly lower than the average, um, but in terms of high offset, <laughs> so here's like the, the uh, four most deviant Redis nodes in the amount of IOPS there is. And you can see that there's one, that's a blue line at the top, that is using like four to five times as many IOPS as the second one. Is, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Now in this particular case, this Redis nodes, instead of one big Redis uh, server using all the memory, it's the one that runs lots of little. So the background saves are going on on 15 to 20 tiny ones instead of one big one. So more IOPS. Okay, explain. No problem. But had I not looked at this, I wouldn't know. I also probably know what my maximum IOPS is. So if I start adding more of those little Redis servers, even though it has enough memory, I might get into other problems. Now I know. Um, and the other one is trends over time. A lot of your traffic is probably seasonal, whether that's like weekly or monthly or daily or quarterly, whatever it is. Um, but to visualize that, you probably want to have a graph that has both the time slots on it. In this case, um, it's the same time last week. So you can see the graphs basically keep track and it's seasonality, it's very common. But had I taken two days next to each other, say a Sunday and a Monday, you would have seen a very different pattern. On Sunday, people get up later and they use the internet less. So if I would have compared a Sunday against a Monday, like, what's the problem? People aren't using my service anymore, things are crashing, people have taken staff to their sides, oh my god, it's a problem. It's really not it's seasonality. Weekend and weekend is very different. All right, so now you kind of know the type of thing to get me excited and why I want to collect metrics. Let's talk about what you should capture. Everything. No, seriously, everything. Because metrics can help you make good decisions, diagnose issues, and correlate them. So any system you should develop should encourage a collection of metrics and make it really easy to do so. For example, when you see your app response time spike, it can be a many thing that's going on. It could be a slow disk, saturated network, swapping, CPU contention, uh, any number of factors. But unless you're capturing these metrics, you won't know. So you end up sitting there urgently re-instrumenting your app, adding log lines to it. Now you're changing the environment. Now it's even slower. Well, maybe your logs are crap and you're writing to a slow disk and now your app is slowing down with actual causes of the logs. So you change the environment. It's like Schrodinger's cat, if you will. So capture it beforehand and know what you're doing. All right, so now that we have a pretty good idea of what we want to visualize and what we can capture, let's talk about how we actually do it. That's why we're all here after all. So here's what we do. We like stats D, collect D, and garage light. What we do is on every single node, we run an instance of stats D and an instance of collect D. Collect D gathers system data, also does monitoring, but for the purpose here, it gathers the system data and passes it on to stats D. And the applications on the same box also talk to local to stats D. Stats D then gathers the statistics, does a bit of basic math, and sends it on to graphite. And then uh, graphite can use for, uh, for storage, for interaction with the data. So let's go into them individually and see what a smart way is to use. 
Is anybody who hasn't heard of Collective before or has never used Collective? Oh, okay, wow. Um, I almost feel like I should have added a few more slides to that. Just so everybody's like, get on with this. Um, so there's many different ways to gather uh, system statistics. We particularly like Collecti. Its job is basically to run a daemon that has a little scheduler, and however often you wanted to run some plugins. What is my free discourse? What is my CPU? You can make it as aggressive or as last as you want. And for anything that it doesn't have a built-in plugin for, it has a very easy way to add plugins. So you can either add plugins the Collect D style, which means that you use their API and you can see Python or whatever you like, or you just run an exec uh, script and then you print stuff out in a certain format. So it's really, really easy to just introspect anything you have, whether that's proprietary or for things that don't have plugins themselves. So we have uh, written some stuff for Redis, for Cassandra, because all of them have admin interfaces that will give you lots of data. But it's no good to me in a log file or only to go and look on the problems that are occur. So I have these scripts that just ping them regularly and go like, so how much free memory do you have? How many keys are in there right now? What's your slowest query like? How many clients are connected? Um, when was the last time you did a save? When's the last time you synced with the master? And we just get these stats. But anyway, um, Collect D is an execution engine that runs for us. And the neat part is of those plugins I was telling you about, you can also set thresholds. So it also gives you very basic monitoring. <coughs> I, I never alert on disk space because that happens, and I only care about response time and error rates. But we do send them to what we call a warning board in PagerDuty, which basically says, these nodes have low disk space, so when you get around to it, just go and do something about it. Maybe just change the or something. would never take down your server, but you want to know. Anyway, so that's Collecti. That's specifically for system stuff and for, for plugins. And then there's StatSD. I have not heard of StatSD before. <coughs> okay, excellent. Glad we're covering this. So Stasi is the core of your metrics collecting setup. Etsy has a fantastic blog post about why you should be using uh, Stasi. It's right down here. I'm going to paraphrase and basically say because it's awesome and it lets you collect a million metrics per second. Um, it's a very lightweight daemon that runs on Node.js and listens for UDP traffic. Uh, Stasi will accept a metric and a value. Very straightforward, does some basic math like on the timers of the picking uh, compute the upper 95th, upper 99th before it sends it off. Um, by default, it will send it to GraphEd as a backend, but it has many different ones that you can support. You can send counters, gauges, and timers. <coughs> we run it on localhost for a very specific reason. One, localhost UDP is guaranteed delivery. Localhost UDP is guaranteed delivery. Um, as you're developing more and more systems, keep that in mind. It's awesome. Or I should say, when localhost UDP no longer delivers, you have way bigger problems than a stat not showing up in stats. It's a, it's a neat little kernel hack. It's simply a different code pattern because it knows both sender and receiver is guaranteed delivery. Um, but you still get all the benefits in your app of fire and forget and not walk. So you don't have to do that TCP and you know, wait for the connection to be established. Just hand it off to the kernel and walk away. Uh, another benefit is that stats collection now scales with the nodes that you have. If the local host stats you can keep up with all the stats you're sending, you can scale horizontally. That's pretty awesome. So that's why we can go from 100 metrics a box to 1,000 metrics a box. And if I have 1,000 machines, I have a million metrics. Of course, we can do more metrics per box because 1,000 boxes per stats would be kind of crazy. But the point is, it scales very nicely with the machine. So how do you think about this? Um, to avoid insanity, pick a naming scheme and stick to it. The one you see here is, is ours. Uh, feel free to copy it straight up. It works pretty well. Uh, invent your own. I don't particularly care. But pick one and stick to it. And I'll explain to you why in a moment. One of the nice benefits of a naming scheme is it makes exploring much easier. Right? When a new app comes up and uses the same naming scheme, you can just go explore the metrics and you know where to look and what you expect. It has a certain hierarchy to it. Um, creating graphs becomes much easier because graphs you can use wildcards and if they're all in the same spot, you don't go crazy, you don't have to go figure out where the wildcard goes. And it makes automated rollups much, much easier, which we'll cover in a little bit as well. So why did we pick this particular naming scheme and what's the benefit it gives? Um, we first of all separated by environment. Prod versus dad versus staging versus prototyping code and so on. Because I don't want my devs who are tinkering with things to mess up my production graphs or be able to not distinguish them, but at the same time, I want them to have stats and have them be treated as if they're production data. Because even though they're developing on it, they're, for me, their work is production. They need to be able to do that, so I need to give them an environment so they can do that. I just want it to be over here, not over here. That's as simple as that. The second one is the cluster name. 
because very often we group our services by cluster and by type. So you want to be able to drill down in what's going on over here. What's going on with the API cluster? What's going on with the WWW cluster? Um, the next one is the application. That's just a prefix for your own namespace. At this point, the devs get to do stuff. They get to name their application whatever silly way they want to name it. And then underneath there, their own metric names. And then we suffix everything with the hosting that comes from. Because one, now I know what hosting it comes from. Because it's localhost uh, stats D, I always know what the host name is, I don't have to guess. And it makes, again, aggregation a lot easier. And also, I can now see, aggregated from the other side, everything that's happening on a particular host. So again, it makes correlations a lot easier. So stats D is really easy to configure. There's a link there, again, at the bottom right, that tells you everything about every config option you ever wanted to know. If you're just going to do the bare bone simple thing, do this. For graphite, set the global prefix. You say stats, end of name, cluster name. Now, every stat that comes in there will be prefixed with this. Because that's the on local host, you know what cluster you're running on, you know what the name of the cluster is. And for the suffix, we set it dynamically. You just get the, the first part of the host name. Be something like API hash 001 or something like that. For some odd reason, stats D uses in this crazy um, prefixing stuff, whether it was counters or timers or so on. They now call that legacy namespace. And it's default to true, so just turn that off and go into the good world where everything's in the same. Uh, you have to pick your percent thresholds up front that you want to calculate because Stasi does the calculation for you. Um, you could do whatever you wanted here. Some people like to collect the lower 10 to see what their best case response times look like. Um, it does create extra metrics, so it's sort of a trade off between how much disk space you want to use and how much CPU you want to use to calculate all the things. We found 95th and 99th answers basically every question in the round, so we picked that. And we delete idle stats as well, because stats D by default keeps sending you a zero if it's ever seen a stat, and then doesn't see it the next iteration. Uh, the benefit of that is that I now know when stats are no longer being sent from our devs, and after, say, a month of not having seen the stat, we just clean up the old stats and the stats file for it, and that's how we can make space. So, little tricks, if you do this, you'll be wrong in what Graphic. I'm going to try this one more time. Who hasn't heard of Graphite before? Less and less. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So Graphite is a system in which you can store data, time series data, that you can <coughs> interrogate for the data, and will paint you pretty graphs for it or returns it to you in some sort of data format that you can use, like XML or JSON. Uh, I hope you all would pick JSON in that case and not XML, but it, it's up to your folks. Every graph you've seen so far comes directly from Graphite. It's just put into their little composer and it shows up the graph. It uses uh, the call WhisperDB, which is like RRD. People familiar with RRD? Nice. Okay. Look, two people go like, yeah. RRD. So it comes in with, uh, excuse me. It uses WhisperDB to store them, which is a round robin data series, which means that your size is bounded. Means that once you've decided what you want to store, it just keeps writing in a circle and it'll never grow over time, which is pretty neat. Uh, and it's open source and free, and it's free as in beer, which again for us is a big deal because we want to put a lot of stuff in there and he plays a tra charge tweet per metric. Mm. It's uh, it gets a little bit uncomfortable pretty fast. One major constraint, and this is why I was harping on about metric naming being a big deal, is that it has very powerful wildcards but doesn't have a search interface. So if you don't quite know what you're looking for, it searches pretty, pretty poor and you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot. So better name well early and then just think about it. Um, so consistent on this. So how do you set up Graphite? Uh, we only run one Graphite instance per data center here. And we do that to minimize the latency between the local host assets and the Graphite that it's talking to. So we don't want it to, to cross uh, out of the data center, but we only run one individual Graphite per data center. You could run a cluster of two or more. Uh, if you want a data duplication, for example, if you're really paranoid about that. Uh, we chose to aggressively <coughs> back up instead and just deal with the fact that metrics have to count. None of our systems will stop running if there are no metrics. It's inconvenient, but it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? I might lose 30 minutes of data that takes me to spin up a new machine and then sync the data back in. OK, that's, that's acceptable. Um, every Graphite cluster will have its own MySQL and Memcache, MySQL for stored user accounts, queries, dashboards, that kind of stuff, and Memcache for ca caching metrics requests. So if you keep painting the same request over and over and over again, um, then it's a good thing that it saves all the metrics it has so far and just counts them in the last minute or two. You should pick one specific Graphite to be your web UI. Um, it should be the instance that has the most data in it, not the instance that is closest to you. 
So our office is based in San Francisco. We have a machine up in Portland. But I picked Ashburn to be the web UI because a good chunk of our data lives there. So the data transfer cost is more than your interaction with the front end. And again, there's a few, um, few really things you want to consider when we set up graph. I'm going to go through those things. All right, data retention. The way in which you can express data retention in Graphite is phenomenal. You can dial every knob you bloody well want. You can say how important the particular rule is, what the retentions are, the multiple factors, how it should be replicated, which pattern should match. Um, I suggest you just keep this. Just blanket for everything. One, it makes your math really easy. And as much as I want to say that we found like the perfect combination of everything, we found this works pretty damn well. So it's 10 second granularity for six hours, that's what the first bit means, of retentions. And the second bit, um, 60 second granularity for 15, I wrote this wrong. <laughs> it's like, that's not right. <laughs> so let's try again, 10 second granularity for six hours, 60 second granularity for 15 days, and 600 second granularity for five years. Um, and it means that after five years, my data's being thrown away. The company's four years old, I feel pretty good about that. Maybe if you're a financial institution, you can get that a little bit longer. Um, the X-Files factor equals zero means that there's no duplication of the data. If you set it to one or two, it'll find other graphite machines to basically be a clone of that data. Um, again, we chose um, aggressive backups instead. Using this, every metric you store will be about a 3.3 megabyte file on disk. So you can easily extrapolate, you know, a million metrics, 3.3 megabyte each, you know how much data storage we can And we find there's a really good trade-off between the size of the files that we're storing and the granularity that we're getting. Um, the 10 second granularity for six hours is not a coincidence. It's the same as the default stats deep flush interval, which is also 10 seconds. So it doesn't make sense to set the granularity any lower than the granularity you're getting from the tool that's streaming data to you. So if you set it lower in stats, you should set it lower in graph levels. All right, aggregations. This is one of my favorite bits. Uh, forgive all the mumbo jumbo, it's more for reference. The bolded bits are important. Um, Graphite has the option to do metric aggregations for you at the server side. And what that means is when they come in, they will generate another stat based on the stat that just came in. You'll pay up front for it in CPU and IOPS, but it's totally worth it if these are stats you use all the time. We basically only look at the aggregate stats. The, the graphs I showed you earlier, they're all aggregate stats, aggregate stats. So the first two lines uh, compute a running average and sum. And because we have these standardized metric names, I can roll them up using the regular expressions. These little brackets are Python regular expressions. Um, the second two lines compute the upper and the lower metrics, so that's how I get the worst 95th percentile without doing lots of math. In the form. And for gauges and counters, if you use them, you should do something similar. Um, we tend to not dive in per host unless there's something that we feel we need to dive deeper on. We rely on our aggregate metrics to tell the story. And I don't particularly care if one host is being naughty. Uh, we have a monitoring and checks and trace that will just remove the load balancers if it is, and it's just, I'm more interested in what's going on, how are these experiences. All right, let's get to the bad part of Graphite, performance. The very first problem you'll encounter with Graphite is you'll run out of IOPS. You will run out of IOPS. Um, does anybody still run a time on their disks, just out of curiosity? Does anybody not know when I say a time on disks? You can do a little finger. So um, on Unix, the, um, the default way that iNodes are set up is that they track when it, a file was last created, when it was last modified, and when it was last accessed. Access is a time. So you can imagine that if you write a million metrics per, uh, per second to your disk, it has to update a million inodes going like, guess what? I just wrote to this file. And because we're operating the system, we know what's going to happen one second from now, which is you're going to write to the file again. It's not interesting that you've, you've done this, that you've looked at it, that you it doesn't matter. So turn off a time and double your IOPS right there. And the second thing is, if you're actually serious about metrics, you just Splurge for an SSD instance, it'll make all the difference in the world. Your IOPS problems just go away. Which will then get you the second set of problems when you run Graphite, which is CPU. Um, the daemons are, are quite hungry uh, when they run full throttle. Um, because it's written in Python, the daemons are all single threaded. So any slowdown, any uh, disks or computing or so on, will be <coughs> slowdown in Python. So run multiple daemons of each type. But you also want fast CPUs so that you can run as fast as possible. So we run all of our stuff inside of Amazon, which is a story for another day. But we use a high one 4x large, which is basically their big boy SSD instance, which you will want to reserve because it cuts down the price by 80%. Um, 
And then we run five relays, six aggregators, and six caches on each node. The relays make sure it goes to the right spot. The aggregators do those aggregation rules. And the caches is basically the, the storage and memcache integration, so it can answer your questions. Um, we still have 50% idle CPU on average, and we still have 40% free disk, despite everything we're collecting. So these machines will get you very, very, very far. Now, Graphite is our tool of choice. We're very, very cost conscious. You'll hear me say that a few more times as we go through this. Um, but there are some alternatives. If you're the type of person who likes to host your metrics in the learning, um, just give Circonus your money. You will not regret this. It's absolutely the best in breed for it. Um, if you like self-hosting uh, an open source solution, Zavis is pretty good. There are wonderful things. I want to go people there. Uh, both of them have a statsity output module that allows you to send metrics just like I was doing the graph line to these two. Uh, again, the links are in the bottom right. It's all open source, go for it. Um, you also have the option to mix and match graphite plus another backend. So some of my colleagues do um, graphite and Circonus, where they send to Circonus only the stuff that they care about alerting on, and everything else just in graphite, where they can tolerate some more loss. The real challenge with the hosted solutions is that the price point has to stay reasonable, and that gets very, very challenging, the more that will. So, dashboard. There are many ways to create dashboards using Graphite. Uh, it has a built-in composer that makes you, lets you make dashboards that's really neat. Um, there's tons of third-party tools, again, all linked at the bottom there. We really like Graphite.js. It's as simple as it sounds. It's a jQuery plugin. It's about 150 lines of JavaScript, and it just makes the Graphite calls really, really easy. Um, the, really, the one thing that we wanted was variables and loops, because we are religious about standard naming schemes, and because all of our services basically act in the same way. I just say, for service 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, pay me this graph. So I don't really want to specify that five times. I want to delete the So JavaScript is really easy for that. Uh, also, all of our devs and all of our operators know basic JavaScript. So if you hand them JavaScript, you're like, I know what to do with this. It's JavaScript that makes HTML. That's really easy. <laughs> so we just have a bunch of flat HTML files. We host them in GitHub. We push them to an S3 repository. That's it. That's our dashboards. We're looking at one right now. Uh, it's actually the Graphite dashboard of Graphite because we care about dashboards and we care about how systems work. And this is the dashboard that tells us how Graphite is doing. Um, the left-hand column, third from the top, that is dropped messages. That's the amount of metrics that it got and couldn't store. The fact that that graph is empty is awesome. It means our scaling sets works. All right, um, there's many other Graphite frontends, like I said. <coughs> the one that I keep hearing a lot about is Grafana, which uh, can be really neat. All kinds of awesome features. So if you don't like this, you can do it that. Cost. Let's talk about cost. So why do we do all this work when I could just pay Circonus a bunch of money and have it work for me? Or because we're in Amazon, we could pay CloudWatch and have a bunch of metrics. So CloudWatch is CloudWatch is 50 cents per metric, which in our case means I would have to give them half a million dollars every month to capture my metrics. Also, their resolution is at one minute. And the industry I work in tends to work on per second. So that's a kind of an application of this metric there. And you can't do composite graphs. So you get a graph for one thing and a graph for another thing. And if you want to overlay them, that's mostly your problem. Um, Circonus, best in breed, awesome. Um, their platinum model is 30 cents per metric, um, which in my case would still be 300 grand a month. I'm pretty sure Theo would give me a sweet, sweet discount if I told him I would come in with a million metric. But still, it's, it's a substantial <coughs> amount of money. Um, you do get a bunch of extra features there. Why? So I then mix and match it. But our graph I'd set up, which spans three data centers right now, is under $2,000 a month, which for over a million metrics means it's left less than a fifth of a penny, 0 0.0002 cents. And nothing hosted can beat that. Now, Graphite does graph, not alerting. Most of the hosted uh, solutions do both. But not every metric requires an alert. But hosted solutions can't really differentiate. They can't know up front what you do and don't want to alert on when they want to give you that option. So by necessity, they're more expensive. But be aware of that as you make it your trade-off. But because Graphite also exposes data as JSON, you can build your own stuff on top of that, or forward some metrics, um, whatever you want to do. But most importantly, the low cost matters because of the line incentives. We want our developers, and we want our operators to send as many metrics that could possibly be useful to us, and we don't want to say no. I'd rather have you send too much than too little. And when you're faced with a half a million dollar bill using CloudWatch, each and every time you're going to have to ask yourself, is this really worth sending? The answer is, well, if things go wrong, yes, it would have been, but you can't know that, so you didn't, and now here we are. So <laughs> you're bound to not track things that would have been incredibly helpful. So keep the cost down, tell them to send whatever they want. 
All right. So the second part of the title was with minimal developer overhead, right? which is why there's two devs in the game and everybody else in operator. Adding stats to application tends to be extra work for developers, and you may or may not be able to motivate everyone to do so. Or maybe for that one language you use, your integrated system isn't very good yet. Plus, you might have some legacy apps that nobody's going to touch anymore. It's like, that works. The guy who wrote it doesn't work here anymore and hasn't for the last five years, so we're just not going to touch it. But it doesn't stop you from instrumenting the environment in which the code runs. It might not give you insight in the very specific of the apps itself, but at the very least, it'll show you that there's a difference in behavior, and that in itself is already very valuable. So I'm going to run through a few bits very quickly, because I am also a little bit running out of time. Uh, despite my promises. <coughs> so I'll show you some of the things that we did that we open source that might be useful for you. Number one, Apache. This is an easy one. Who haven't heard of Apache? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Love my audience. So we use all of our static content in Apache, all the beacons we do, all the data collections, all static content in Apache gets logged and so on. Because there's no dynamic service, there is no way to instrument it other than Apache itself. So I wrote mod stats D, which captures all the relevant requests directly from, sorry, all the relevant metrics directly from the request. So the GitHub project page is down there. This is all that you do. You install the thing, and there's a, a Debian package if you're so inclined. Uh, if you use Red Hat, I don't know what you do, you jump or something. And then uh, you basically put this, you put this in, your, uh, in your configuration. Stats D on, now for this particular location, stats will be collected. And it's a smart thing to put a prefix in there so you don't get any collision. So you have the whole stats.environment.cluster name, and then you get .patchy, and then whatever the request is. So let's say you get a localhost API foo, you'll get Apache, that's the prefix, API.foo, it was a get request, returned 231 milliseconds, stats end. So I don't know what the application is running behind it, frankly I don't care, but I know that happened. Um, there is tons of knobs and dials of what you can make stats to do, of the aggregations for you, clever logging, whatever you like. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, check that out. Um, we run this on a billion requests a day, roughly, we see about 20 microsecond overhead of doing this. So for performance, don't worry about it. Really good. Varnish. People here use Varnish? Nice. You should be using Varnish. Awesome. We put that in front of all of our dynamic content. Um, and we put our uh, caching and fallback behaviors in Varnish as well. So it's very, very important to instrument Varnish because we rely on it not just for, for, for caching and performance and load and routing, but also for fallback. So the very least that we capture is the backend use, the time it took to respond, and the response code. So now I know that backend foo is healthy and it's responding quickly or slowly or whatever. So again, even if the surface itself is poorly instrumented, that legacy app we were talking about, you can also put varnish in front of it, instrument it like that, and get an answer. Uh, in terms of extra overhead, uh, we do tons of traffic through our varnishes. CPU users went up by about half a percent and a handful of microseconds extra request time. Uh, we thought that was well worth the trade. So, for that, I wrote vmod stats <coughs> which basically works just like mod stats in, in Varnish. Um, it's a little bit of pseudocode here because the variables that are being referenced from the right aren't available through the entire request. You have to capture them, and instead so you say, backend, was it a hit or a miss? What was the response code? How long did it take? That's it. Again, the link is at the right bottom. It's a whole tutorial there, all the knobs and dials. Go forth and do that. Um, the stats generation is basically the same as mod stats D because that's the consistency I like so much that makes my graphs really easy. All right. Remember this graph? Uh, the service, although it's fully instrumented, none of the service instrumentation itself is in there. This is all coming directly from Varnish. So it doesn't matter what service somebody spins up, it's going to bind Varnish, so I have these metrics. Okay. <coughs> Who likes and or uses supervisor? You, you can raise your hand further, sir. <laughs> you and I, we, oh, oh, two, awesome. Two of us uh, use supervisor. It's, um, it's a process manager. It works like Etsy, init CSV, Damien tools, stuff like that. We used to manage, we used to manage every service that we run on every node. Uh, we have it instrumented with logging, restarts, process limits, and so on. It's also a really well-monitored instrument. It's the thing that we really understand, understand well. It's written in Python, makes it easy for our devs to extend it. For keeping track of events in supervisor, like start, stop, restarts, <coughs> crashes, back offs, and so on, I wrote something called Sulfite, which hooks up as a event handler and sends its stats to stats to. So um, we release all of our Python code on our own PyPy repository, which is why it's a pip install Sulfite and then the extra Nix URL, uh, because it's easier for you that way than go to GitHub and then clone it and package your own stuff and PyPy repository. Um, and then you set up as an event listener in supervisor, and now just like you have to deploy, and the MapReduce drive, you can have your starts and your stops at your services as well. So you can see the answer. 
but really the best thing you can do is instrument, uh, to instrument your infrastructure is to provide a base library in the language or language that you really love. We're a big Python shop. I'm the Perl guy, but all the other guys are Python guys. So we started with Python. And uh, Java is the other language of choice. And I figured I'd just run you through what we do and how that works. So we have something called Crux Standard Lib. It's the standard lib that we build all of our stuff off of. Uh, it makes very opinionated choices. It's open source. Feel free to use it. Uh, or look at it. Get good ideas. Tell what we did wrong. Write something of your own, whatever you like. Um, the idea is that we basically have two types of things that we write. They're either command line tools or they're services. If they're command line tools, they have a Crux application. If they're Tornado services, which is what we use for dynamic services, it's Crux Tornado. And from there on out, we have all these Yomi lovely sysadmin flags and switches and, and goodies in there while they can just focus on writing code. It makes some really opinionated choices on how stats should work, how logging should work, and so on. We think they're the right opinionated choices, but then again, we would because we wrote it. So the installation instructions are right there, the docs are right there. Here's what you do. Um, whenever you use anything based on type standard lib, you get logging, which is the topic, and stats in there. By the default, stats are off, and there's just a dummy interface loaded. So you can send stats, and you have a compatible interface, but it's not going to be sending any stats. You put it in production, you tell Puppet to do dash dash stats, and the stats start flowing free. Same thing with logging. And because of this standard standardization, it integrates nicely with all of our config management stuff. And anytime a new dev comes up and says, I've got the new foo server, so like, that's great. What's the GitHub repo? Oh, dash dash stats, dash dash logging equals warning. We're done. And we now get all this stuff. Uh, and the nice thing is it lets your developers do the right thing without having to do any extra work. So this is what it looks like. It's basically <coughs> Python code. The only thing you have to do is like inherit from Crux CLI application and give it a name. The name is what we use to identify ourselves in logs and it's prefix for stats, stuff like that. And then we just use it. Um, most of the legacy <coughs> apps, definitely all of our new apps are now using this. So it's sort of tons of traffic and we're, we're quite happy with it. So give it a go. At the worst case, if you can't write a nice library for the particular code you have, <coughs> I bet you can fall back to Unix application or something simple. Basically, any language has a binding for a UDP packet, and any language can probably shell out to <coughs> a simple uh, shell call. That is what we do in Jenkins when we deploy something. That's it. Because now, this app has been deployed. So I couldn't figure out how to write a plugin in Jenkins that would write one. Shell script. Does it. And now I know when something is deployed to the vertical lines, it's that. No more. Um, so this basically works for almost everything, except for JavaScript. Uh, so we wrote a separate little stats app, not yet open source, kind of ran out of time. Um, but we'll make that release, release in two, and just takes the stats as a query parameter and sends in the stats to you. Um, because you can make async calls to any type of HTTP endpoint from JavaScript, you can just instrument the living crap out of your code, and now you know. That's kind of like real user monitoring using the same framework. All right. Doesn't that your code? Um, Puppet produces lots of information about the state that it finds and the changes that it makes. Most of them end up in log files, report files, and so on, but this is within your own report generator. So we use, uh, we wrote something called uh, Graphite Report, which is a Puppet report module, which now sends all this data directly to Graphite. So when you change this stuff, when exact happen, when Conto is being installed, and so on and so forth, we have all that stuff directly in Graphite, and we can again cross correlate that. Uh, it also tells us how long our Puppet runs take, and the answer is too long. <laughs> and longer every time, because we keep adding stuff to Puppet. Um, and then lastly, cost is another major KPI that we keep track of, because of all the stuff that we do in Amazon, if the data, seems, if the data size changes, um, if one of our customers kind of didn't tell us how much traffic they were going to send, and it's way more than they thought it was going to be, um, that might influence our cost. So, we pull the data directly out of CloudWatch into our graphs and we cross correlate that again with some other data things like request per second, like data sizes for MapReduce, and so on. And all you have to do is this. And this gets you back the dollar amount that you spend from the first day of the month until the day that you give it. And you chuck it in the graph. And so we have little graphs that tell us exactly what we're spending on each and every service. And we track the answer. I do apologize for rushing a bit at the end because I felt bad about breaking my promise, which I totally did break. But that was the last slide. <laughs> so I'll take a few moments for Q&A down here. None of you are required to stay. I know there's coffee and cakes. There's coffee and cakes, right? Am I promising coffee and cakes in there now? There's, there's coffee and cakes. So go forth and be merry. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, come find me down. Thanks.